But uh, it's a sermon that I often preach in the fall of the year, and it is, it is still fall until the 21st of December. <laughs> I usually preach this in October, but uh, it just, I didn't feel that it was the right time. But it's not yet winter. We still have opportunities ahead this year. And uh, McCartney uses the Apostle Paul's words. Thank you, Ruth, for reading that for us. His words to Timothy as a wake-up call, as I have here on the sheet, to us card-carrying procrastinators. You know who you are. <laughs> A wake-up call to consider opportunities, not only in our earthly relationships, but our opportunity for salvation and a relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, as, as a husband, as a father, as a grandfather, as a pastor, as a friend, I look back on the last year and I think, man, there's so much more I could have, should have done. But you know what? God gives us chances every day, doesn't he? And so, as I open our sermon today and share with you, in slightly adapted language, because some of the language that he used uh, today would be considered archaic, so I've changed a few expressions, but uh, pretty much it's the sermon that, that you'll find uh, on the internet, you Google, uh, Come Before Winter or Clarence McCartney, and you'll see that many pastors have, have used the same theme and have adapted it, but I'm presenting it largely as he did. But before we begin, I want to ask the Lord's blessing. Heavenly Father, as I share these thoughts on this precious text, in many respects, Paul's last testament to his dear friend Timothy, Lord, I pray that our hearts and my heart would be touched with not only the responsibility, but the privilege you give us to be used by you. And as was so eloquently stated in the Sabbath school class I was in this morning, we need to respond to the pleading and the urging of the Spirit when it comes and act on it. And so, Lord, I pray that you would make me invisible and may the words of Christ and the Holy Spirit come through to our hearts today. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Napoleon Bonaparte and the Apostle Paul are among the most renowned prisoners of history. One was in prison because the peace of the world demanded it. The other because he sought to give to men that peace which the world cannot give and which the world cannot take away. One had the recollection of cities and homes which he had wasted and devastated. The other had a recollection of homes and cities and nations which had been blessed by his presence and cheered by his message. One had shed rivers of blood upon which to float his ambitions. The only blood the other had shed was that which flowed from his own wounds for Christ's sake. Napoleon once said, I love nobody, not even my own brothers. So it isn't strange that at the end of his life, on his rock prison in the South Atlantic, he said, I wonder if there is anyone in the world who really loves me. But Paul, Paul loved all people. And from his lonely prison at Rome, he sent out messages that glow with love unquenchable and throb with fadeless hope. When we get into difficulties in life, we're fortunate if we have a few friends upon whom we can count to the uttermost. Paul had three such friends. The first of these three is that one who would be the friend of all, the friend who laid down 
his life for us. The second friend was that one whose face we first see, although we won't recall it, and oftentimes the last face that we see, that of the physician. And this friend Paul handed down to lasting renown with two enduring accolades. First, Luke, the beloved physician. And in the passage that was read for us this morning, Paul says, only Luke is with me. The third of these friends was the youth from Lystra, Timothy, half Greek, half Hebrew, whom Paul affectionately referred to as my son in the faith. When Paul had been stoned by the mob at Lystra and was dragged out of town and left on a heap of stones, left for dead, perhaps it was Timothy who when night had come down and the passions of the mob had subsided, went out of the city gates to search among, um, amid the stones and the rubbish until he found the wounded, bleeding body of Paul and putting his arm around the apostle's neck, wiped the blood stains from his face, offered cooling water to his parched lips, and then took him home to the house of his godly grandmother Lois and his pious mother Eunice. If you form a friendship in adversity, you never forget that friend. The hammer of adversity welds human hearts into an indis indissoluble bond. Paul and Timothy each had in the other a friend who was born for adversity. And Paul's last letter is to this dearest of his friends, Timothy, whom he has left in charge of the church in far off Ephesus. Paul's in Rome in prison, Timothy is in Ephesus. And he tells Timothy that he wants him to come and be with him at Rome. But he is to stop, first of all, at Troas and pick up his books, because Paul was a scholar to the end, and he's to bring the cloak, too, the coat which Paul had left at the house of Carpus in Troas. What a robe the church would weave for Paul today if we had the opportunity. But this is the only robe Paul possesses, and he needs it. It's getting colder. The summer is waning, and he wants his robe to keep warm. But most of all, Paul wants Timothy to bring himself he says, do your diligence to come shortly to me. And then just before the close of the letter, he says, do your diligence to come before winter. Why before winter? Because when winter set in, the season for navigation ceased on the Mediterranean Sea. And it was dangerous for ships to travel out to sea. How dangerous it was. The story of Paul's last shipwreck tells us. If Timothy waits until winter, he'll have to wait until spring. And Paul has a feeling he will not last out the winter. For he says, the time of my departure is at hand. We like to think that Timothy didn't wait a day when he received that letter from Paul, but he started out right away for Troas. And he picked up the books that Paul needed and the cloak that he'd forgotten in the house of Carpus. And then he sailed away past Samothrace to Neapolis and from there traveled by the Ignatian Way across the plains of Philippi and through Macedonia to the Adriatic Sea where he took a ship to Brundisium and then went up the Apian Way to Rome where he found Paul in his prison read to him from the, from the parchments, the scriptures, wrote his last letters, walked with him to the place of execution near the pyramid of Cestius, and saw him receive the martyr's crown. Yes, come. Come before winter. There are some things which will never be done unless they are done before winter. The winter will come and the winter will pass. And the flowers 
of the springtime will deck the breast of the earth and the graves of some of our opportunities, even perhaps the grave of a dear friend. There are golden gates of opportunity on this autumn day that are wide open, which next autumn may be forever shut. There are tides of opportunity now flowing at the flood. Next autumn, they will be at the ebb. There are voices speaking today, which a year from today will be silent before winter or never. I like autumn. I like its mist and haze, its cool morning air, its field strewn with the blue aster and the goldenrod, the radiant livery of the forests, yellow and black and pale and hectic red. But how quickly the autumn passes. It's the perfect parable of everything that fades. Yesterday I saw the forests in all their splendor, and Solomon was not arrayed, in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But the rains fall, the winds blow, and the trees are stripped and barren. And so it is that every returning autumn brings home to me the sense of the preciousness of life's opportunities, their beauty, and also their brevity. And it fills me with a desire to say something, not merely something about the way that leads to eternal life, but with the help of God, something which will move us to take the way of life now, today. And so taking our suggestion from this message of Paul in his prison to his dear friend Timothy in far off Ephesus, come before winter, let us listen to three voices which are now speaking so earnestly to us and which a year from today may be forever silent. First is the voice which calls for reformation. Your character can be amended and improved, but not at just any time. There are favorable seasons. In the old iron mills of a bygone day, one could watch the streams of molten metal writhing and twisting as they poured from the furnaces of a wire mill. And before the furnace door stood men in leather aprons with, with iron tongs in their hand, ready to receive the, the, the metal and direct it to the molds. But if the iron was allowed to cool below a certain point, certain temperature, it refused the mold. There are times when life's metal is, as it were, molten and can be worked into any design that's desired, but if it's permitted to cool, it tends to a state of fixation. When the angel came down to trouble the pool at Jerusalem, then was the time to step in and be healed. There are moments when the angel troubles the pool of life, the angel of opportunity. Then it is that a person, if he or she chooses, can go down and be made whole. A man who'd been under the bondage of an evil habit relates how one night, sitting in his hotel room, was assailed by his old enemy, a besetting sin, and he was about to yield to it, when suddenly it was as if an angel stood before him and he heard a voice which said to him, This is your hour. If you yield to this temptation now, it will destroy you. If you conquer it now, you are its master. He obeyed the angel's voice. He refused the tempter, and he came off victorious over his enemy. That man is not unique in his experience. For to many a person comes the hour when Jesus stands at his or her door and knocks to see whether we will obey or reject. These are precious and critical moments in the history of our lives. In your life, there may be that which you know to be wrong, to be sinful. And in His mercy, God has awakened your conscience or has flooded your heart with a sudden wave of contrition and sorrow. This is the hour of opportunity. For now, chains of evil habits can be broken, which if not broken, may bind us forever. 
Now golden goals can be glimpsed and decisions made which will affect our future course and our ultimate destiny. We all have opportunities in our spiritual life. Seasons in our lives when we are more vulnerable to the pleadings of the Holy Spirit. You can build a bonfire anytime you please, but the finer fire of the Spirit, that's a different thing. Along with the voice that calls for reformation is the voice of friendship and affection. Suppose that Timothy, when he received this letter from Paul asking him to come before winter, he said to himself, yes, I'll start for Rome, but first of all I must clear up some matters here in Ephesus and I need to go over to Miletus to ordain some elders and then over to Colossae to celebrate communion. And when he's attended to these matters, then he goes over to Troas, gathers what he needs for Paul, and there inquires when he can get a ship which will carry him across to Macedonia and then to Italy, or one sailing around Greece into the Mediterranean. But he's told that the season for navigation has closed. No vessels will sail until spring. No ships till spring, he hears. And all through that anxious winter, we can imagine Timothy, if that were the case, we can imagine him reproaching himself that he didn't go at once when he received Paul's letter. And he would wonder all through that winter, how does it fare with my friend, the Apostle Paul? Well, when the first vessel sails in the springtime, Timothy's a passenger on it. I can see him landing at Neapolis or Brundisium, and he hurries up to Rome, and he seeks out Paul's prison, only to be cursed and repulsed by the guard. He's not there. And so he goes to the house of Claudia or Pudens or Narcissus or Ampliatus, all those beautiful Greek names, or Mary, and asks, where, where can I find Paul? And I can hear them say, and are you Timothy? You haven't heard? Paul was beheaded last December. And every time the jailer would put the key in his door, Paul thought you were coming. And his last message was for you. Give my love to Timothy, my beloved son in the faith, when he comes. How Timothy, if that was the case, how Timothy then must have wished that he had come before winter. Before winter or never. Jesus himself said it. The poor always you have with you, but me you have not always. He said that when the disciples complained that Mary's costly ointment could have been sold and expended in behalf of the poor. Me you have not always. And that is true of all the friends we love. We cannot name them now, but next winter we shall know their names. With them, as far as our ministry is concerned, it is before winter or never. In the old Abbey Kirk at Haddington, one can read over the grave of Jane Welsh, the first of many pathetic and regretful tributes paid by Thomas Carlyle to his neglected wife, and I quote, for 40 years she was a true and loving helpmate of her husband and by act and word worthily forwarded him as none else could and all worthy he did or attempted. She died at London the 21st of April, 1866, suddenly snatched from him and the light of his life as if gone out. It's said that one of the saddest sentences in English literature is that sentence written by Carlyle in his diary about his deceased wife. Oh, that I had you yet for five minutes by my side, that I might tell you all. Twice, coming to the sleeping disciples, whom he had asked to watch with him in the Garden of Gethsemane, Christ awakened them and with sad surprise said, What could you not watch with me one hour? When he came the third time and found them sleeping, 
He looked sadly down upon them and said, Sleep on now and take your rest. One of those three, James, was the first of the twelve apostles to die for Christ and seal his faith with his heart's blood. Another, John, was to suffer imprisonment and exile on the Isle of Patmos. And Peter would be crucified for his Savior's sake. But never again could those three sleeping disciples ever watch with Jesus in the hour of his agony. That opportunity was gone forever. You say when you hear that a friend has, has passed, why that can't be possible? I saw him only yesterday. I saw her only last week. Yes, you saw them then, but you won't see them again. And you say you intended to do this thing or speak this word of appreciation or amendment or show this act of kindness. But now the vacant chair, the unlifted book, the empty place will speak to you with a reproach which you can hardly bear. Along with the voice that calls for reformation and the voice of friendship is the most important voice of all, the voice of Christ. More eager, more wistful, more tender is the voice of Christ, which is now calling men and women and children to come to Him and to come before winter. I wish I'd been there when Christ was calling His disciples. Andrew and Peter James and John by the Sea of Galilee or Matthew as he sat at the receipt of custom. There must have been a note not only of love and authority in his voice but a note of urgency as well for we read that they left all and followed him. The greatest subject which can engage our mind is eternal life. And so, when the Holy Spirit invites us to come to Christ, He never says tomorrow, but always today. If you can find me one place in the Bible where the Holy Spirit says, believe in Christ tomorrow, or repent and be saved tomorrow, then I'll come down out of this pulpit, for I will have no gospel to preach. But the Spirit says always, today, never tomorrow. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Today, if you will hear His voice, harden not your hearts while it is called today. Now, the reason for this urgency is twofold. First, the uncertainty of human life. A long time ago, David, in his last interview with his dear friend Jonathan, said, As thy soul lives, there's but a step between me and death. That's true for every one of us. An old rabbi used to say to his people, Repent the day before you die. But they said to him, Rabbi, we don't know the day that we will die. And so he answered then, Repent today. Come before winter. The second reason why Christ, when He calls a person, always says, today, not, not tomorrow, but today, is that tomorrow the disposition of our heart may have changed. There's a time to plant, a time to reap. The heart, like the soil, has its favorable seasons. Today, someone may hear this sermon and be impressed, interested, almost persuaded, ready to take his stand or her stand for Christ and etern enter into eternal life, but they postpone the decision and say, not today, maybe tomorrow. A week later, a month later, a year later, they may hear the call again to repentance and to faith, but it doesn't have the same effect for the heart has grown colder. Christ said today, they answered tomorrow. Once again, I repeat the words of the Apostle Paul, come before winter. And as I pronounce those words, common sense, experience, conscience, the Holy Spirit, the Scriptures, 
and the Lord Jesus Christ all repeat with me, come before winter. Come before the haze of Indian summer has faded from the fields. Come before the November winds strip the leaves from the trees and send them whirling over the fields. Come before the snow lies on the upland and the meadow brook has turned to ice. Come before the heart is cold. Come before desire has failed. Come before life is over. Come before winter. Come to thy God in time. Youth, manhood, old age past. Come to thy God at last. <laughs>